Hello and welcome to Painless Universal, a conversation with myself and Well. Today I'll be talking to Stella King. Stella King is based in London. Her story inspires me because she went through a health problem and this health problem came from nowhere. But through that challenging time, Stella King has managed to graduate from university with a law degree and still striving. She'll be telling us her story, her incredible journey, she'll be sharing that with us, and how she's turned her pain to joy. Meet Stella. Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome again to Painless Universal com- uh, Show, a conversation with myself and Welsh. I am with Stella King. Stella, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, and nice oh. Yeah. I'm glad to be here. Thank oh, you. Great. I'm so glad to have you. Um, your story is inspiring. Um, you know, your journey. I did I did a little a little bit of a bio there, but I think I didn't want to say too much because nothing beats it coming it um, the whole journey coming from yourself. You know, before we get into that, could you just tell us a brief summary of who is Stella? Okay, who is Stella? Um well, my name is Stella, um, Stella King, or well, formerly known as Stella King. Um, I'm, <laughs> or, my origin is Nigerian, I'm, but I was born in the UK. I've lived here all my life. Um, I am a lawyer by profession. I sometimes get involved in media there and there. And I also um, am a founder of a charity organization called King's Humanity. Um, yes, yeah, so far that's just a, a little about me. So yeah, that's fascinating. You know, you grew up um, in the really good, be- um, humble beginnings because um, your family really, you know, did everything they can to take care of you guys. Can you just tell me a little bit about about growing up in the UK? How was that? Okay, yeah, um, growing up in the UK was fine. Obviously, I I told you I'm um, the first generation of, or second generation, is it of? Um, Nigerian parents in the UK um I yeah I I guess like things were okay growing up until um and then things really turned around eventually for my parents when things started to go really well their businesses started booming and um yeah things just I, I really don't know what to say but things really went well so far then I know I know it's so hard because you see a lot of Nigerian community here and you know there's two different angles of them there's either those that their businesses are doing well what they're doing very well in their profession or those that are just really struggling to make ends meet and you know it's really glad to I'm glad to hear that your parent and your parents business was booming and everything was going well and you were able to go you know go to good schools how was school yeah. How was going to school? And um, because you went to a very good school, how was going to school as a, you know, it's always hard as a black girl going to school in the UK. How was that? Oh yeah, it was fine. It was good. Um, only eventually when I went to sixth form or um, you know secondary school when I changed um, schools, it was very different because I had moved to a neighbourhood where it was majority was white people. Unfortunately to say, but you know, and I wasn't used to that. I was used to seeing more of the black um, community and not really seen so it's I had to learn to adapt to that um, culture that type of yeah so a bit it was a bit challenging because you know you were like the only black person I think there was only like two of us that were black in a classroom for instance and you know you could imagine but eventually you know over time I was able to adapt yes uh, that's why I always say to people, it's not about being in a place and being different. That should be the concern. It's about thinking about ways that, yeah. that because it doesn't matter if, you know, people could go to, for example, one could go to Middle East, one could go to Asia, people are different. But what what is what stands you out is that your ability to be able to adapt to those different circumstances you find yourself in. Your story then turned around, you got sick, you know, everything was going perfectly fine. Then you got sick. What was it that you were diagnosed with? What happened and how was how did it start? Okay, so over the years growing up, I actually used to always fall ill, but um, they never found anything wrong. I just always complain about having the stomach pain or from the age of seven, I'd always complain. But every time we went to the hospital, 
they would say they couldn't find anything. And then it was um, when I went, when I was about 12 years old, I can remember, um, it started to happen literally every month. I would go into this pain every month and I, I would have to miss school. And we'll go to the GP and they would say, there's nothing wrong with her, just give her paracetamol. That's all they kept on saying constantly. It was on to us 13, I went to America. And when I was in America, I had this excruciating pain, um, a pain I've never felt before in my life, like around my stomach, like it was just there for a good 48 hours, I couldn't sleep, I was just crying nonstop. And then um, it was my uncle, because my parents were in the UK, they just left us there for a bit. And it was my uncle that said to my auntie, take her to the hospital. I've had enough, take her. And when they took me, they thought it was my appendix. That my, and so they said, right, we're going to have to have an operation. So I went, I went to theatre. I went under, yeah. And they um, basically opened me up. And when they opened me up, they realised it wasn't actually my appendix. But they took it out anyway because they said it wasn't necessary to have an appendix and they realized that I was inflamed around the kidneys and um so I was in hospital for a good four weeks after that before returning back to the UK and then once I returned back to the UK I had to come back and stay in hospital and they did all the tests um they did the biopsy on the kidney to see exactly what it was and eventually they diagnosed me with something called mesangial capillary nephrotic syndrome. And what that is, is basically um, you swell up all over your body, like if you fluids. Um, so my, my face would swell up, my stomach would swell up, my legs would swell up, um, everywhere will swell up basically. And um, because your body is basically retaining fluids in the body because the kidneys are not doing the work it should be doing which is to get rid of all the fluids and toxins it normally does mm -hmm. now and then when they gave us the news um obviously i was only 13 i didn't really know what this really was but obviously we cried and we, because they said oh by the time i'm 21 i would need to have a transplant or else i'll die and I, yeah, I just burst into cry, to tears. And um, I was on medication from that day onwards. So like I was taking, I was taking steroids, um, all sorts of tablets a day, like, you know, um, up, up close up to 30 tablets a day I was taking um, throughout. And then in between my years, um, like from 15, 16, I would say 17, I didn't really see the symptoms again, Ooh. like before. Yeah, until when I started university, I went straight into uni, uni, Canterbury University at the time to study law. Immediately in my first term, I just started to swell up again, like I had a relapse. And then they said, okay, you have, they, I had to come back to London and they said, all oh, right, okay. You, um, you've just had a relapse and that's where the problems began. So every year I was going through that, I would be in the hospital literally every year, um, going back and forth with this relapse on these medication. I started to take injections because, because of the kidney issue, I became anemic. And so I had to start um, injecting myself three times a week. Um, and then from there, age 21 came to, I think it was November, 2010 precisely and they said it was time for me to go on dialysis that my kidneys were working less than 20 percent and I can just remember crying burst into tears because I didn't expect this to happen to me because I'm I, I believed so much in God I'm a Christian and I believed so much in God that God's going to heal me. I used to say to them, God's going to heal me. I'm not going to have to do dialysis. Literally that they thought I had a psychological problem. So it was very, to me, it really, it really gripped me. And I remember running out of the hospital, literally running out of the hospital, running away, going to church, going on my knees, crying to God, like, why? But you promised me, you promised me this wasn't going to happen. And it finally did. And I was, um, it was 
dramatic it was tr tormenting for me it was um yeah so eventually um apparently I went home eventually that day that night and um my sisters told me oh um the hospital the hospital's been calling they're threatening to call the police to come and get you um that you need to go back so the next day my auntie came and she got me to come back to the hospital and then they said it was time and if you know Anne from there what happened onwards it's been a lot a lot um okay, from let's break it down so we stopped like a we okay you did this that um, they tell you at 21 in October that you have to go through this dialect uh, dialysis process like <laughs> Like yeah. yeah and all of a sudden you realize that life will never be the same yes because I could imagine where you're coming from I know I live with a chronic illness myself and I know that age is such a critical age because that is the age where you are bonding you are really finding who you truly are yeah and all of a sudden you're you're tied to this thing you're tired, you're thinking, oh, why can't medicine work? Why can't this work? Why can't we just do it the same way we used to do it? Your life yeah. must have changed for oh, you. Trust me, at that point, I thought, because I was really popular, to be honest, I was very popular growing up and I had a lot going on for me. I had aims and achievements that by this age, this is what I'm going to achieve. And I just felt like my whole life had collapsed. I thought, I'd never get married again. I'll never have children again. I'll never be able to do all the things I wanted to do again. I thought my life was over, yeah. literally. I, I imagine so. I, I, I feel you. <laughs> because when, you know, when things like that happen, uh, and this is why I'm telling people about the virus, the pandemic, that don't make it short in your life. This is just a moment. Yeah. Through it. It's we'll just a moment. It's just a moment. We would get through it. And we're all going to look back at this at life and say, wow, number 2020. Oh my goodness. I can't remember. I can't believe we got through it. Yeah. And I think this is exactly what you're saying. The same message you, you're saying right now. When you were 21, they told you that message. You were sharp. You were thought, thinking to yourself, what the, what the age am I going to do <laughs> myself yes how did you get by what happened next? okay I'm going to tell you this is yeah. what okay. you need to know. well I can tell you from there what actually happened to me because it, it seemed like things started going all the way down yeah, it um, was that way though always remember you get when things happens it goes like this first before yeah. they back up. come yeah. back up yeah life has taught me that um so what happened is they said okay since you're young um, why don't they put a um, instead of a um, instead of a fistula or hemocath? Okay, so a fistula is what they normally put in your arm, and um, which they create so to put needles in for you to have your dialysis, or there's a hemocath which I have currently up here on my chest, or there's something they call a um, yeah, right? Yeah, I have it right here, okay, right here on the yeah the hemocath, a permanent line, yeah to the dialysis so and then there's something that they put in the stomach um i i can't believe i penet penetrate i can't even remember right now what it's called but yes i um, mean the stomach so they said so okay they said i'll be able to have a better life with the one in my stomach since i'm young that will be overnight every day i will do it over eight hours while i'm sleeping and i thought you know to be honest i didn't want to do it um my mom had just come back again she traveled she had come back so she was with me and I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want this um, thing in my stomach. Um, but no one would listen to me. And they insisted I should do that. I should take that option because of what everyone said, I took the option and it was the worst thing ever. It was the worst option ever you could think of. Um, they put it in, as soon as they put, pull it in my stomach, I was in, in so much pain, so much pain. And when you would call the nurses, the doctors, no one would listen to you. They would just um, say, oh, just take painkillers again in a hospital. And this is meant to be um, the specialist units. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was just, and this, and I went home for Christmas day. 
but I couldn't even celebrate Christmas because I was in so much pain. So the next day I came in and they wanted to do dialysis with the light, with the um, thing in my stomach. I couldn't do it. And then um, they had to take me back in to the, um, and they had to take me back into hospital. And when I did, um, it was the surgeons that actually came downstairs to sit, visit me. The surgeons came downstairs to visit me and they said to me, um, they think that there may be a problem. And also because what made me come in when they realized it was time for dialysis was because my heart was, I had this pain in my heart, which I had never felt before. And I knew it wasn't normal. And when I told the consultants about the pain, they thought it was just a chest infection or something. And I said, no, I know this is different. I know what a chest infection is, but they wouldn't listen to me again. So it was the surgeons that came and they were like, don't worry, we will take care of you. As soon as they went and took me in, I had to go into theater again on the 31st of December. And they had to remove the thing in my stomach. Do you know what they found out, Anne? No. The thing that they put in my stomach mumbled up into my bowel system, meaning that any time it could have exploded. And meaning that the, the surgeon who even inserted it should not have inserted it, knowing that I was inflamed because it was written down on the documents as well, that he saw inflammation, but he still put it in and he was not supposed to. And then they found out that around my heart was actually fluid, which was suffocating my heart, causing me to have that, yeah, which, right. so if the surgeons had not come to help me, that would have been the end of my life. Of course. And then, the, and then on, the, on New Year's Day, I had to go back into theatre again for them to do the rest of the operation they needed to do. And then I was in intensive care, intensive unit for at least three months. So it was very intense, I could tell you. It was really, um, the consultants, they did come, they kept on apologising because obviously I could have taken it further and sued them. But my mother was like, yeah. you know, you're a Christian, just forgive them what you want right now is your healing is your healing more than anything else and but it was um because because of what they did I did suffer in the long run um every now and then even for the whole year two years I kept on having pains in my stomach even then again it still happened where I get episodes because of what they did with, um to me um yeah so it is very daunting yes and because of that, obviously affected my legs at that point. I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. So I didn't think I would even get back on my feet again. You know, I that's really what, it, you know, I thought the old wow. me was gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's unbelievable that you have such an amazing story you have gone through so much and so many people don't even know this illness is this. yes many people did not do not know this is this and you have gone through all of this and what i've taken from this you know we're still going into the story but the key things i've taken from this is about you got diagnosed in america because they wanted to take out your appendix yes one and one thing I was concerned about is that if you were not living with your uncle, how would you have managed with the insurance stunt? Because that's yeah. something we don't talk about easily. Yes. America is very difficult when it comes to chronic illness, because then you have to think about the insurance. You said you ended up staying there for four weeks. How would you take care of that? Um, okay. All right. Okay. So like I said to you, my parents were doing very well. So my parents could afford it literally. So mm -hmm. when um, they told my parents, oh, this is how much it's going to cost. Um, my parents actually sent the money over but funny enough the hospital actually said when we wanted to pay they said don't worry about it we will take care of it oh yes that's what they said wow yes that's amazing I know that's really amazing I know I know that's a lot of Christmas miracle I'm mean, a miracle I, at the time wow yeah, it was I, yeah that's what they said so okay so, so but those are things people need to be aware of the things that could happen is that you had this you had this diagnosis because they opened you up. And if they didn't open you up, they probably people who still be going, oh, take painkillers, take painkillers. But because they finally did, you had this diagnosis and you now know what's wrong. Yeah. And the, the next thing I get to is that when you're about 21, your life totally changed because the method of treatment changed for you. So it's no longer the normal method of taking tablets or taking this, taking injection. 
now you're moving on to okay you have to go through the proper process of you know being there having these things and set into into you you yeah. went through all this struggle but you look, look at you now you're back on your feet you're you're live, learning to live with it a lot of people who have been going through your sit current situation would be thinking to themselves oh my goodness how am i ever going to get through i mean even i mean not your current situation people who are going through even hard times right thinking that their life is over before we get into what how you found your joy but what key advice would you give to people on going through a difficult time right now health wise okay what i would advise to them is that um like what I would advise basically from my, from what I've been through is just believe that anything is possible. It doesn't matter what situation you're in, you can come out of it. I'm a living proof to that, that you can come out of anything. And it's about your mindset. If you're going to allow the situation to determine your future. Um, I decided that I wasn't going to allow this sickness, this, what, this kidney problem, um, to be a stigma in my life and I decided that I was still going to be who I want to be, be, become what I want, achieve everything I have set my mind to. And because I had that mindset, things started to change for me gradually. It wasn't straight away, but it was, it starts from the mind. It starts from that mental process. Um, and also having a good support system, to be honest, because if I did not have a good support system, um, like my family, my mom, my sisters, my brother, my aunties, they were literally every day pushing me and saying, you can do this, come on, get up. You know, it was tough love, it was tough love, but it was worth it, I can tell you that. And I had mentors I listened to on a daily basis who let me know that your life's not over. Your life is not over, that what are you speaking with your life? What are you speaking with your mouth? What do you want to see? What do you, what do you see in your life? Yes, because the doctor said this, or they said, do you know how many times they told me I'm going to die? Mm. So many times over the last years, I've been on dialysis for the last 10 years. Mm. And I can tell you the amount of times they told me I'm going to die. And I've just looked and laughed and said, nope, I'm not going anywhere. Not my time. No. It's not my time. No. Because I've chosen that it's not my time. Yes, things can happen, yeah. but I will decide when it's my time. That's very true. Yeah. How, do you, how did you go on to find your own joy? Because you are now, you, you graduated, you're a lawyer now, even though you went through all this turbulence, difficult time, how did you find your joy? What did you do differently to go on back, get back on your feet after going through difficulties? Of how, and how did they finally get the, to do the, the insert around? Okay. The so obviously when they couldn't, um, when the parentonal dialysis, um, line wasn't working they had to put the hemocast straight away inside mm -hmm. um but i've had to change a few times you know um um so that's how i was able to use that but what happened in between that time is that i was listening to actually someone called pastor chris and i would listen to his messages and he actually spoke and he would just let you know that it's not like i said he would let you know it's not over yet just because you're in this situation doesn't mean that your life is over you can still be mad you can still be what you want you can still be, like for instance like I said I thought I'll never get married I won't have kids I won't live my life he let me know that I could be that I could I could have my life I could have my kids I could have my children and the more I listened the more I believed yeah. that's true and and faith grew faith there was this faith that grew in me and as that faith grew I just decided yeah it just changed my life completely so even respective I could tell you that it wasn't an easy journey because um one way or the other I would always get sick in between even while I was on dialysis and that means I would have to leave 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 uni again and you know at times you're thinking oh should you go back or not but I was determined to go back and eventually I finally finished at 26, 25, 25, 26. I finally finished. Um, I finally finished, I think at that time. And yes, I, I got through with it, even though in between that, I also had to have a right valve heart operation mm. as well. Yes, I did in between it, 
but I never let anything stop me. Even at one point when I was in hospital, we had an exam to sit. I left the hospital to go and sit that exam and I did pass it when I came back. So it's been, it's been a journey, but if you're determined, if you are really determined to still have the life you want, you can, regardless of what it is. Like, um, I think you will go into it as we go along, but I am doing a lot of things, yeah. you know, more than what most people do who don't have anything wrong with them. So, yes. Do you think um, that determination of doing more is, is because of the time you lacked? Because you lacked all those time and you were in hospital. So every time you come out of hospital, you want to double catch up. Do you think that determination comes from there? I like, think it's because of the way I've always, in general, I think I've always been someone that has always had a plan and has always wanted, okay, get this done, get that done. And um, so it's always been innate, yes. But obviously, I feel, yes, the fact that obviously I had those delays has given me more of that drive, more of that driven to have a purpose and a reason to do what I am doing now more than anything. That's yeah. And that's really, that's really fascinating because I think a lot of people lose that and they either, uh, they either are diagnosed with something or something happens to them and as either they go to, we have two ways to go. You could either go and say crumble up and stay in bed for the rest of however long you want to stay. You could either go up and work as fast and keep catch up with others. And I love that route you took, which is, um, you know, it doesn't matter what happens to me, I'm still gonna go and keep doing what I know best because this keeps my mind busy, keeps me up and takes my mind away from um, being ill. Um, what is Stella doing now? What, 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 are you, what, are you, what is keeping you busy these days? Okay, so what, <laughs> um, so what's funny is that um, while I was still in uni at the time and I was doing dialysis, so I would have to go to the hospital, which I'll spend like three and a half, four hours there on treatment, um, you know, where the blood circulates and back and forth. And then I'll go straight into uni or I would go straight into um, the studio because I happened to get a job on TV um, where I was a TV presenter on a show called Current Affairs, Current Issues. And so I was doing all of that at the same time, like a TV presenting and hosting and at the same time. And so I carried that on when I finished university. As well as that, I started working in a law firm. Immediately I got um, a job in a firm. And um, so I was basically juggling dialysis, um, TV media and the law firm together at the same time and also I had to go back to school to further my education and law and everything you um, and everything and so that's what I did I, it's just basically I've had to learn to juggle everything and it means planning and so um, yeah so currently what I am now doing after everything is that I am now doing a teaching course to become a lecturer in law Yes, so I'm doing that now. And I'm also, um, set, I've started setting up my own law firm called Sterling Advocacy Solicitors. Mm -hmm. I also founded a charity organization in 2017. Now it's called King's Humanity. Um, when I first had the plan and vision, it was in 2014, which was all planned and everything. Um, it just so happened that um, when I had a visit to Nigeria, I saw the plan, it just came to life immediately. I wasn't expecting it, but before I knew it, we were, I was doing all sorts of work, um, helping people, going to different villages, outskirts, like remote places that people would not even go to, um, looking at the environmental health factor of things, um, seeing you know the issues they were going through basically doing research and we did research we were doing filming and before you knew it king's humanity was birthed out of that and from there our vision in King, king's humanity is to have eventually build hospitals specialist hospitals that deal with terminal health issues or long-term health conditions because like you could understand in africa in asia in south america these countries are actually lacking in those areas and what you see is that a lot of people are dying so i think it's a privilege that i was born in the uk and i had the privilege to um be able to have the free treatment i'm having because I think about it and I think, hold on, if I lived in Nigeria, for instance, 
you know, where my parents originally came from. Okay, yes, although my parents were doing good at the time or so, how long would I have lasted on dialysis? Because bear in mind that I've been on dialysis now for the last 10 years. I've not had a kidney transplant yet. Mm. And um, you find out that a lot of people, for instance, in Africa, they spend their life savings within a year or less to just do dialysis and they die because they have nothing to keep them going nothing to you know give them a life a substance I and I look at someone like me and I feel if they had that extra time they could po possibly do something you know do something that could change the world do something because when I look at myself I see somebody who can because of the privilege I've been given in the UK I know I can do so much I can and that's why I'm taking advantage of this time and people saying you know I'm here I'm alive I can make a change regardless of what situation I'm in um so what King's Humanity does is that we look into towns into states you know in countries and do our research find out what's lacking there in terms of health issues mm -hmm. and then we our aim is to build hospitals there advocate for free medical health care as well you know ensure that that's our aim it's especially next year we're really going to push forward because of the covid this year we've had to um slow it down mm -hmm. but next year we're really going to push forward to make sure things are done and also like um yeah and also like just to yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of planned around King's Humanity and also do like go out to um, places, rural areas, you know, a system like, you know, little help amenities that they may need there and there on the, but it mainly focuses on the health, yeah. So that's really good. I'm glad that you've taken that talent and the lessons you've learned from your own, you know, your own sufferings and your own pain, you've used it and thought about others as well. I think it's yeah. always so important that when you go through something so challenging that you utilize that challenge and tell your story and you can tell either tell your story or you can either help others who are going through similar circumstances yeah. and may not need that help um you know what is your hope as a final question what's that what's your hope for the future for what you um for your for your illness and just give me a little bit of if you could just give someone a little bit of a synopsis of what exactly is your diagnosis Okay, so um, with the kidneys, basically, um, like I said, you swell up all over, but because I'm on dialysis now, I don't swell up as much, but what happens is that affects you from like weeing, like going to loo to pee, like everybody else. So you can't really pee. Most people on dialysis can't pee at all. Yeah. And um, the reason why you've got to do the dialysis is because your blood has to be rinsed on a regular basis to get rid of all the toxins in the oil else the toxins will kill you or or it's there to remove the fluids or else the fluids will literally drown you inside that you're drinking so you've basically got to minimize how much you drink as well you've got to so most people on dialysis are not supposed to drink more than a liter a day wow. yes of anything um foods you've got to be careful you can't really eat anything high in potassium so like potatoes um tomatoes bananas anything that's literally high in, in potassium you have to really try and stay away from it and obviously they say no salt um, no salt in your food at all so um literally what i do personally i minimize those things but yeah it's like that and um in the long run i've actually been i've actually been like trying to fight for me to get a kidney transplant but they've been um right now they had a meeting the heart doctors the consultants for the kidneys and who else yeah the surgeons they all had a meeting um and apparently the surgeons were a bit skeptical skeptical to have a for me to have a transplant right now um, due to my heart. I did a heart test that they asked me to do yeah. and I passed it, but unfortunately they said they're still skeptical. I don't know if I would be able to handle a kidney transplant. Okay. So this is just where I am at the moment. But if I did have a kidney transplant, obviously it will make life much more easier. I wouldn't be held down for me that is sometimes it's like a prison like you have to go because you know your life depends on it mm. that if you don't do this dialysis you know that you're gone the next day mm. 
So um, obviously it would, it would be easier to have a kidney transplant because then you'll just have to be taking medication again and just make sure you take it every day. Even though a kidney transplant, again, is not a lasting result. So like they've said, they've said to me, I'll probably need two kidney transplants in my lifetime. So yes, that's where we are. Wow, that's very interesting. How does it affect traveling if you have to travel? Yes, yeah, so, okay, so that's another thing. Um, obviously we're not part of the EU anymore. Well, we're coming out of that, so now you'll have to pay for your own treatment, whatever the amount is in that country. For instance, I think in US it's like $500 per session okay. so and I have to do dialysis start at least three times a week wow. so you're looking to spend about 1,500 in a week mm. if you go somewhere and yeah if you go to but if you go back to Nigeria for example how would that work yeah so you pay for dialysis there again three times a week um some places about 200 pound a session 300 pound a session so yes wow but yeah this is very interesting. I mean, I don't think a lot of people understand the gravitas of what you have to go through on a daily basis, but still going through this with a smile and still making headway in the world. You know, Stella, I really appreciate this conversation. I appreciate your time. Um, you know, sharing your story is just so important because you really touched on key things that a lot of people take for granted and don't understand the struggles that even though you wear a smile, you still have to go through this difficulty, but you were you do it very graciously. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.